that's, that's a great question. Now you think. Now you're thinking like him. <laughs> right. <laughs> Apparently, we can't knock it until we try it. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Never that's... thought about it that way, Tony. Right? A glass half full kind of guy. You know, it, it's all about mathematics, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so mm. weird weird piece of news there, but uh, I, I definitely got a kick out of it. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Does that fall under like the, you know, the whole calculations thing where a man will say he slept with four times as many people where a woman will say half as many? Does, does that yep. mean that was actually a false representation of shoes or was there actually more that we just didn't know of like under the floorboards? Yeah, he, he told he, he told the cops originally he had sex with 400 pairs. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. but they whittled it down. <laughs> hey. He's proud of it. Yeah, let him boast. <laughs> Oh, boy, I don't know how your family looks you in the eye after that, but okay. <laughs> okay, so speaking of Racy, um, I had found an article, and this is, uh, this was, you know what, I, I was actually, uh, I, I was like, sure, why not? So the, the title on this one is that uh, apparently spite porn uh, is now taking off during the lockdown times. What is that? Right? That's exactly what I said, so I had to read this article. Um, apparently the, 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 the article reads like this, hate your ex, a porn star is offering a new way to make them feel bad for any real or perceived past slights. Uh, Allie Eve Knox, who bills herself as an adult content creator, uh, specializing in fetishes, particularly financial domination is busy these days selling custom to order videos that are a little bit different from what you'd expect. Uh, Knox is uh, getting all kinds of requests uh, for videos she has called spite porn. Uh, Knox first does a variety of sexual things to pique the interest of the viewer, uh, usually an ex-partner of someone who wants to get back at them, uh, before abruptly pulling a bait and switch and, and basically berating the viewer. Uh, she said that uh, a woman just ordered a custom video for me to send to her ex-husband and have me shame him for all the shit he had done while they were together. Uh, she then basically said, like, this has brought uh, almost a new obsession uh, and uh, um, life to, to her or meaning to her life because she's able to hel help a whole bunch of people. Uh, the, the the woman basically gave Knox a, a greatest hits list of of what this guy uh, would basically like for him to potentially lure him in. Uh, his, she had said that his porn obsession, narcissism, and how he felt so self-absorbed, uh, stuff that you could kind of speak to most about most men, apparently, she told Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, I've uh, bef So basically, when she calls them out, she'd be like, I've befriended your ex-wife. Uh, you are stupid and careless and selfish. And uh, we'll basically go on and on. Now, the funniest thing I thought about this whole article, though, was that she considers herself uh, a, a fetish. Um, okay, let's say let's say a uh, <laughs> what do they call it? An adult content creator with fetishes, but particularly in financial dominations. Isn't that most women? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, don't do, do you need to be a fetish person for that? <laughs> uh, I joke, I joke, really. Uh, you know what? Um, my wife will kill me for saying that. But um, <laughs> it's, but you know, like the first thing I thought was like, um, it, that's an actual fetish. Like, what do you say? Like, you only made two hundred and fifty this week. I it's made like five. A, it's like a super short catfish, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's totally what it is. They actually should call it catfish porn because basically that's what it is. They're luring them in uh, to to uh, think that it's going to be something sexy and then to turn around and just call them an ass. Wouldn't that um, be a great way to serve people papers when you're suing them? Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Although, I mean, I think that would only work for a certain demographic, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Right? But maybe you know what? If this is the case of divorce papers, maybe maybe that's why. <laughs> maybe too much porn was involved. <laughs> Yeah. There's always porn involved somewhere along the line. That's eventually it is, yep. <laughs> yep. Anyways, so there you go. If if uh you know you ever get a suggestion and or a me an email from a porn star saying they she wanted a chat, no, don't answer it. Don't know. Don't go don't get involved. I'm warning you now. What happened to Candygrams, man? Right. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, when we've got uh, strippers delivering meals on heels, uh, I, I feel like maybe uh, candy grams are just too uh, uh, too pure. <laughs> <laughs> boober eats. Yep, good old boober eats. <laughs> uh, so right on. So, Neil, thanks for joining us again. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're actually, one of the first things we want to talk about, uh, of course, is your, um, I, I want to say newest novel, um, but uh, I guess it's technically your second newest novel. With the, Are we talking about the Bomb Squad? That's right. <laughs> so yes, I know. I know the order of my books. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's so, so much for bomb... like our listeners, right? I, I want to say your newest novel, but technically speaking, your newest one's coming out in a couple months. So yeah, well, yeah. you know, the, the Bomb Squad just came out in March. Yes. So uh, sort of like. Um, I'm ringing uh, or making bookends with my two books for the COVID. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when my first book, when the, the beginning, when we first shut down, the bomb squad came out, like literally as we were shutting down in New York. And now as we were about to come out in the next couple of weeks, Hope City is now being released. So it, trust me, this was not done intentionally. Um, <laughs> had nothing to do with any of that going on, but that's just is how it seemed to uh, to work for me. Um, so I guess there is some meaning to that. I don't know. Um, time will tell. For sure. I mean, it's amazing that you already, um, for, for 2020 have two novels out. I mean, a lot of people, you've got years between books and, and I'd love to say, Hey, where are you finding the time? But, uh, I think with COVID, everybody's got a lot of time on their hands. Yeah. Well, these two came close, um, back to back because I had a delay with my editor. Uh, and so the bond squad sat for a while. Before okay. she got to it, so that was one of the reasons why we had you know, these two. I don't usually release books, two books, within uh, three months of each other or two or three months. So I was going to say you're setting the bar pretty out. high, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's like I'm not writing faster. Yeah, the but, um, well, because I had wondered because I mean I d I don't think I know anybody who would work on more than one book at a time. So I'm thinking you've got to either be the best multitasker ever, uh, or there had to be something happening behind the scenes. There's nothing. There's no magic secret sauce. That's for sure. It's just me <laughs> typing away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I don't write two books at the same time, but I will uh, revise one or or through my editor uh, while I'm writing a new one. So that happened, but I'm basically done with the with the manuscript uh, completely before I start another one. It's just I, I couldn't imagine writing two books at the same time. I um, I wouldn't know how people would even do that. I mean, with uh, I, I mean, you'd have to basically stop sleeping and uh, and then uh, potentially have uh, two computers on the go and and four sets of hands. I don't know. That's that's crazy. Well, if if you, if you just remove the time part of it, just so say you said. Okay, I'm going to give myself a year. I want to write two books, and I want to write them at the same time. You know, it's that you have to have that. You know, so you sit down, you're writing book A, and then you know, then, then tomorrow I'll, maybe I'll write book B. Um, you know, so you have to have these two minds going on continuously. But you know, we do watch multiple TV shows, um, so we, you know, we are though that is a passive thing. It's not, it's not a creative uh, outlet, but you know, we are able to do mo more than one thing at a time. That. So now that I'm thinking about it, maybe I'll try that. You know, that would be amazing. Find two books at the same time. If you do it, yeah, you have to make sure it. you you document it and and video maybe and just we could like time lapse it or something. It'd be amazing. Yeah, you'll see me like on the floor in a fetal position, sucking my thumb. Um, <laughs> like, what have I done to myself? <laughs> that's totally uh, you must be quite creative to be able to pull that off because uh, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. It'll be a task. It would be a task, you know, because you, you get really involved <laughs> in your story as you're writing it. Um, you know, I write organically, so I don't have an outline. Mm -hmm. So I'll have an idea of where I want to go. I have an idea where I'm starting. Well, my, I have a better idea of where I'm starting rather than where I want to go, but I still have an idea sort of where I want to go. I don't know how I get there. I have no clue. Um, so as I write my stories, they take me where they're supposed to take me, I suppose. And I, then I get to uh, to conclude them. So yeah, it, it, it surprises me of how this story ends up because I, you know, a lot of a lot of times I had no inkling of something was going to happen until it happened in my story. You know, there's the old, there's a saying, the story writes itself, mm -hmm. and I've experienced that. I got to tell you, I've experienced like all of a sudden 
I'm writing and I, and I go off into something I was not expecting to go off on. And um, I'm like, wow, how did, how did I get here? Um, <laughs> but that's that's what I enjoy about that organic creative process. That happens to me too after a really long night of drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's what you know. Hemingway said, write drunk and revise sober. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I love it. There, there's, there's, it helps uh, sometimes to, to get the creative juices flowing. I feel like in that you know, creative really pro- interesting there, I think um, going back and if you're writing uh, in parallel, seeing the similarities uh, of your writing styles in each story while you're kind of in that headspace. Well, if you're doing two at the same time, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I do have a style now. I mean, I develop a style um, that as, as my writing, as my stories have developed, uh, it became a story. My style has also become a style from writing these books. So, Typically, in terms of the mechanics of my book, I, I write with short chapters. Uh, an average chapter may be three or four pages long. And I also write in a very clear, concise way. Um, so I get a lot of comments from people saying, I love your chapters because they're short. Which, I, when I wrote my first book, I, that's how I wrote it. I went from scene to scene quickly, changing points of view, like you might see when you're watching a TV show or a series today, you know, they, they chop from scene to scene, quick scenes. I might take two, three minutes. And then uh, you go into another scene where another character is interacting in another couple of minutes. So that's, what, that's how I write. And, and people like that because that's how people engage with stories now. You know, they, they don't mm-hmm. want to see 20, 30 page chapters. They want to go, let's go three pages, four pages. Good. I could, I could digest that before I go to sleep tonight. I read three, four pages. I'll maybe I'll read another chapter, go another three or four pages. So yeah, it's a great you know, way to blast. Through it makes it, it makes it manageable for people who, you know, are not avid readers, but want yeah. to start reading and getting into it. So it's, uh, you know, it's like, um, come on back, come on back. You can read a book again, um, and I have something maybe you might be interested in reading. I, I think I'll entertain you. That's a great approach. Yeah, it's a uh, we're we're kind of in a in a reduced attention span world these days because uh, we're so busy, um, and uh, you know everything's switching to short snippets. You know, the average YouTube video is a lot shorter than it was you know even five years ago, and um, a lot of companies are switching to micro learning, which is kind of what you're describing a little bit. There's just those, those quick snippets of information uh, that are easy to digest and uh, people do seem to respond to that a lot better. So it sounds like you're, you're right along with the, the 2020 style. I love it. Spoken as a true yeah, millennial. Well, you know, <laughs> and you know, I, 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 and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that, um, you know, many times you'll watch, you watch a show or whatever it is and, you get the you get the gist of what they're trying to communicate in a scene, but it, it but it continues. I mean, it, you could stop it at a certain point, um, or even series anyway that go on too long. Um, you know, after a while, the story has been told. You can't keep telling the story anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have two or three seasons of a good show, and then after that, it's like you lose your you to lose viewership because people don't care about the story anymore because there's no story left to tell. You know, stories like you know they play themselves out. It's it's so funny that you you mentioned that because um, my my son and I were having this conversation at the table the other night and and uh, he was like uh, so I don't know if you watch or heard the sh- heard of the show The Flash it's about the Flash the superhero and um, every every uh, intro to every new episode I think it's in like its fifth or sixth season and um, my son goes. I'm Barry Allen and I'm the fastest man alive, except for in this episode where there's someone faster. And and basically that <laughs> happens every episode for six seasons. Yeah, so it's true. It's uh, it, you're absolutely bang on when you when you say sometimes. It's yeah, best but just there's to a lot of success in that too, and having the same story told over and over again. Think of yes. think of James Bond. James Bond is the same story every single time. Yeah, yeah. Um, think of Sherlock Holmes same story every single time so there's a lot of those stories you know we like we like stories that do what they're supposed to do you know there's a comfort in indiana that. jones stories yeah yeah. There's, yeah right so you know there's also the idea that when i write i want to have some things that the reader is going to say yeah i i knew that i, I knew that's going to happen mm-hmm, right so mm-hmm. they, there's that comfort in saying okay yeah i'm, I'm in here i'm with you in this story but then at the same time, I want to have twists and turns where the reader goes, well, I wasn't expecting that. That's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, you know, trying to work with the reader and bring them along, 
you know, you, when someone sits down and read a book, it's not a, a one-hour affair. It's not like watching a show or 